yeah, there you are. I, I'm the, I'm just so technically challenged, you know. I, <laughs> well, I am too, but I don't care. I mean, I, you know. Yeah. So, it depends. I was, I was with, I, w- I wasn't for a long time in the world of audio. I was very much uh, involved in all of my, uh, the whole process from the time the musicians were assembled until the record came out. Yeah. And then when everything started going digital, well, then yeah. it you, uh, was getting too complicated for me to follow, and I, I just lost interest in being that much involved in the audio part of the recording process. Yeah. So do you do you remember your first uh digital digital recording session? First recording session. Uh the first recording session I did was when I was a young child. Yeah. Uh, we had a little band with my brothers. In fact, I used Clarence White's guitar on it because they were over in this little studio near L.A. Mm-hmm. We were all over there together at a recording studio, not to make records, but to go over there. Yeah. There was a guy that owned the studio, liked the band and the music, and he just wanted to record a bunch of stuff, so he did. And... You know, whatever happened to those things, I don't know. It's been so long ago. You know, um, there is a, you know, the uh, UNC uh, uh, traditional or a folk, Southern Folk Life Center, UNC, they they um, have a recording of some family, like a family band that you were in. It must have been exactly what what they were talking about, or what you're referring to. Yeah, it would have been me and my brothers. Uh, yeah. God, it was a horrible band. We had a <laughs> band of player that was, will go down in the ranks of history as being the worst five-string band of player that ever did. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's quite an accomplishment. <laughs> At this point... Our conversation, Tony picks back up with the topic we had talked about before I started the tape. It's about the May 1976 tour he did with the David Grisman Quintet in Japan. was torn to shreds by you. And if you pick them up again, we'll start our life anew. And if you do, someday you'll find that you were wrong and I was right about the time that finds. 
but no, you know, there was uh, back to the thing about the Japan thing. I don't want to take up a lot of time with yeah. it, but what we did is we had two bands, essentially. Mm -hmm. We went over there. We took the regular David Grisman Quintet, uh, the first configuration, and we took uh, Bill Keith and Richard Green so that we could have two different, totally different shows. We could have uh, the quintet as one set mm -hmm. and uh, traditional, more traditional bluegrass stuff with Richard and uh, Bill Keith. Yeah. And boy, they were playing their butts off. Yeah. Especially yeah. Bill Keith. I was, uh, I had a voice back then, too. Oh yeah, yeah. But you know, one of those albums is out. Uh, the best bluegrass show, and I'm proud of it. I mean, there's yeah. some really good stuff on there. Yeah. You know, I'm singing. I know what it means to be lonesome in B. It means to be lonesome in B. Wow. Yeah. You sang. I mean, you really could sing very high back in the day. Back in those days, I could. Uh, the bummer about it, it's bittersweet because it was it was hard to do. I didn't feel at the time like I was straining myself, but I was. Okay. In other words, nobody was would listen to those recordings and go, "Well, Tony is straining his voice to sing it." I know. All right. To anybody listening, there's mm -hmm. nobody out there in this world, even me. I don't. I didn't even feel like I was straight. Yeah. Uh, it just whatever came out came out because I was a good voice. And, mm -hmm. um, but it was all recorded exquisitely by. Japanese people at every one of those concerts, they would bring nice consoles in there and studer tape machines. And, yeah. Uh, and Grisman right. has masters of all that stuff. But, okay. Uh, for a while, he was going through them to pick out the shows that we did, but there was one in particular that stands out is that record you mentioned. It's a bluegrass album. Right. You know, so... Then you played like the Brisbane Quintet uh, material, and then you'd have the alter, alternate bluegrass. Yeah, we play a whole long set with uh, the David Brisbane Quintet as it existed. Mm -hmm. We'd take an intermission, and then when we would come back, then we'd come back as a bluegrass band. Right. And. Uh, you know, we wouldn't use Daryl Anger on fiddle. We'd use Richard Green. Right. We wouldn't use Joe Carroll on bass. We'd use Todd Phillips. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and of course, Bill Keith on banjo and Grisman and myself. And, now, with uh, Bill Keith, I, did you first meet him at the, the round the Grisman recording session there, the round, uh, Rounder record? No. I had no Bill Keith. Uh, we were just acquaintances. Okay. It's like, in fact, I helped Bill Keith put together a band for that record. Uh, he didn't even have a bass player. He couldn't find a decent bass player. And I mm. said, "Well, I said, man, you know who I'll bet is right there and would give his right nut to go over and be part of this album is Tom mm. Gray." Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Tom Gray ended up being a bass player. Okay. But a lot of people don't know this. Yeah, I mean, this is something I would can say. I mean, it's just. One of those things, but no, that's when Grisman and I met. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's how 
Chris That's and right. I had never shook hands or never talked or anything. You know, I wasn't aware that aware of his music and until right. I heard it one morning when we got up before we had to go to the studio. Yeah. And the first the first few seconds of that music it turned my whole life around. Right. And Grissman had heard me booting it some with the old D twenty eight because I hadn't mm. had it that long. And he liked it so good and I said and I heard that music, and I went, good God, who's that? Who's that guitar player? And he said, well, that's John Carlini. Mm-hmm. I, I hadn't met Carlini. I said, good God, man, I'd give mm-hmm. it my right not to be able to play that music. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I said, man, I want to tell you what. He said, the way you play, he said, you can play this music. He said, as complex as it sounds, he says, you'd be playing this music in no time. Yeah. And consequently into, after the recording session, coming to where I live, lived in Kentucky and spending a few days with me. Instead Mm. of going straight back home to California, he had some time. So he came and spent a few days with me. You know, and he set in with a new south where we had a gig at the time and, yeah. you know, wow. things like that. And then the rest is history. Right. Yeah. So what, what what did you learn mostly from it, the most from him? What was the the most useful things? Was it a chord, jazz chords or? Well, you know, I don't know. It's not one thing. Uh, there's a lot of facets of the learning process and learning to be an integrated part of that band. Uh, uh, there's so many different facets that are just mysterious. Yeah. You know? In other words, Grisman, I owe him so much because he was the one that convinced me that the complicated stuff John Carlini was doing on the tape that he played me, which was called the Great American Music Band. Yeah, string band with Richard Green and... Yeah, with Richard and uh, Alan Carney and sometimes David Nickturn. And, uh, yeah, Nickturn, right. Uh, different people, but... Was Todd was Todd I Mahal? music and it was like magic. Yeah. And I thought... I think Taj Mahal was in that band. Yeah, Taj was a bass player for a while. Yeah. Uh, Jewel and Idlinger was. Uh, mm-hmm. There would be different players that would come and go. Now, and, if, I, 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 I'm getting sidetracked, but I have to ask you about David Nickturn. He's the one who wrote uh, Classic Banana? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I saw. I have a, a, an audio from one of their live shows, the Great American String Band, and they they played it there. And uh, it was called "My My Plastic Banana Ain't Stupid" or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I I mean, I played it so that the melody.
case, we have a special from Los Angeles, Buell Neidlinger. Fine. Buell is one of these peace love cats, you know, really is, really is groovy. Buell. David Nick Turn on uh, guitar. He wrote that last tune also. Jerry Garcia, banjo. Fifth, sixth string. We'll have to turn that mic up. It's a softer instrument. David Grisman on mandolin. And Richard Green on the fiddle. Edgar was a great guy. He really was. I mean, he, well, I'm yeah. sure he's still around doing something. No, he actually oh. passed away last year. Oh, he did? Yeah. Oh, man. No. No. I don't know, but those were the days, boy, I want to tell you. And there was music in the air. Mm-hmm. And in the Marin in San Francisco, it was just, this new music hit like a ton of bricks. Yeah. It's Are we talking, is, is this like 1975? Yes. Well, that was a big year for you. I mean, you were, you started out the year with recording Rounder 0044, you know, one of the top albums ever in, in bluegrass music. And then you went from in Lexington, you went to, Northern California. It must have been the big contrast just culturally, too. Well, I grew up in Los Angeles, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. You know, I was used to the big city. And yeah. Of course, I didn't live in San Francisco proper. Right. Uh, everybody lived... If you cross the Golden Gate Bridge, leaving mm -hmm. San Francisco, as soon as you cross the bridge, you're in Marin County. Right. Where Mill Valley is, that's where Grisman lived, and, you know. Yeah. I don't know, but, uh, boy, those were the days. Tony, you must have been and we rehearsed. rehearsed. And we rehearsed, and we yeah. rehearsed. And Grisman wanted it to be so right on that I arrived in October, and that band did not play a gig live anywhere until January uh, a few months later. Thank you. I'd like to briefly introduce the members of the band here so that uh, everybody knows who everybody is. I'll introduce first the um, young man that wrote this last tune that we just played called Swing 51. It's about my favorite guitar player. Tony Rice. It's about my favorite fiddle player, too, over here. Daryl Anger. You know, if I, if I would hire a mandolin player, he'd have to be great. <laughs> this is Todd Phillips on the mandolin. <laughs> and holding what seems to be the largest instrument on the stage <laughs> is a young man whose cup runneth over. Champagne Bill Amatnik. <laughs> and uh, holding what must be one of the smallest instruments on stage. Mandolinist extraordinaire David Grisman. Thank you very much. We'd like to send this out to uh, Kathy, who's having a birthday, I guess. I got a note. 
And uh, this, I think, is her favorite tune. It's called Waiting on Vassar.
Was that at that great American music hall? No, it was at a place in Bolinas, California, and we didn't use a sound system. Okay. A little hall that they had there, and it was, uh, I don't know, a band created some amazing music. I oh, sure. But that's just un- uncanny how good that music is, and how creative it is, and I just, well, he just didn't come together. You put in a lot of effort, of course, and but it's it's just some of the most incredible music I've ever heard. And I know it's, out, it's still just now catching on. Now I did four instrumental albums that were, you know, only instrumental. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could compare it to Grisman's music mm-hmm. to some degree, but it was. Yeah, sure even more complicated. Yeah. And those records, if you could have seen my royalty statements that came in on those records 20 years ago and then seeing them now, you wouldn't believe them. John, it's just like after all these years, people are just now going, Jesus. Mm-hmm. This is impossible for somebody to play a guitar this way. <laughs> no. uh, you know, albums like Backwaters and Still Inside, you know, and those yeah. things are just not coming on. People are buying them like crazy. Yep. And there was so much that was going on. No, there wasn't. I don't even think there was one month between 0044 and uh, Keith's album something old, something new. Right. And, uh, they were all right there together. In fact, they were recorded in the same studio because Keith didn't even have a studio lined up. And I said, well, we just got through with an album in a great studio. You know, let me, you know, call these guys. So then Bill mm-hmm. Keith and I together arranged, you know, the only, I mean, we arranged what, ended up would be his album, you know. Yeah, that's, that's a great, great album. Yeah, there's some loose moments on it, but yeah, yeah. I was learning then that being loose was okay. That's right. That's a very different from the hardcore J.D. Crow style bluegrass, I guess. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> and, uh, of course, in Bill Keith and I uh, and uh, we had a real good band that went over to Europe. They played several countries. Oh yeah, that. that's right. I've seen some pictures from that. Uh, myself and Daryl Anger and Bill Keith and Briskin and Bill and Matty. Uh, no, okay. There's some studio recordings. Uh, really. Video and audio that's exquisite. I bet. Uh, of us playing some bluegrass over there together. Yeah. And, and, yeah, well, that's... Uh, some smart. of the trip was real bad in foreign countries, and some of it was real good. Yeah. And he ended up in England uh-huh. after spending all that time in some of the other countries. Mm-hmm. For one thing, I love Switzerland, but I couldn't communicate with it the people because of the language barrier. Right. But it was just so beautiful. And mm-hmm. But by the time we hit England, mm-hmm. and I walk out on a street and walk into a store and say, hey, I'd like to buy a bottle of beer right there and a pack of cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Talk to the guy. You know, and I right. just felt like such a relief to get rid of this <laughs> language barrier. Yeah. So you, I know you were very well received in Japan, and were you surprised that, that they were so into the music? Uh, no, I wasn't, because by then they had been over here and uh, uh-huh. to the States, and right. they had their own little magazine out, and there was a lot of communication that Mm-hmm. back and forth between the bluegrass scene in Japan and what was going on over here. Yeah. 
you just feel it in your bones that this relationship with the U.S. bluegrass scene and the Japanese bluegrass scene were going to, they were going to collaborate in a way that, yeah. you know, yeah. it was just going to heal everything that, you know, from all those years ago. Oh, sure. But sure. I did my first, and a lot of people don't know this, the first album I did was done with a guy that just died about two months ago. Yeah. Uh, Saab. Well, Saab I, I don't know if you know who Saab or not. Saab. Yeah, he's a good, good, good guy. Had a record label called Red Red Clay. Right. And, uh the audio on that is a hundred times better on the Japanese version than it is over here. And I, he wrote me a letter asking what I consider doing an album. And I said, yeah. And I, would, I certainly would. And I got to think about it under one condition that you let uh, this person at King Records mm-hmm. Bob Trout. If uh, after talking to Bob Trout, I talked to Saab Watanabe long distance on the phone. Said, "Yeah, I'd love to, Saab, and I, I think we can work something out." But what I want to do is have the initial releases uh, distributed and sold only in Japan, uh, okay. and put out the same album over here on a different label. Yeah. Would you be into that? He said, yes, they didn't have any problem. Discuss uh, back and forth uh, why it's on like clay, red clay records and then on King Bluegrass. And, uh, a lot of people don't know that, but the first record I did in my life was done for Saab and Speedy Watt and I'll be on red clay records. Yeah. And uh, I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad it's out there. I wish they'd reissue it. Uh, because the version that ended up coming out over here on King Records, the audio wow. was so bad. And I know. During those days when uh, there was an oil shortage mm-hmm. and the vinyl, do you remember the days of reground vinyl? Yeah. Sure. They would take records that were no good for nothing, melt them down because there was a shortage of stuff to get vinyl. And they wow. never did get it. And those records sounded absolutely horribly scratchy. Yeah. Not to mention the artwork and stuff like that and the, the yeah. layout that was done over here. The one in Japan with the plain gray cover that said, got me a Martin guitar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It. it sounds a million times better, the audio, than, you know. Yeah. Didn't have to pay any of the musicians. Oh, My good. brother, Bobby Sloan, and J.D. Crow went in there and didn't even know much. No money was ever talked about. They never mm-hmm. asked for any, and I never volunteered. <laughs> So if they got paid, I don't know about it. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think anybody was worried about getting paid because, you know, Crow yeah. wouldn't have cared. He yeah. just wanted to go in there and play and be part of it. You know? Yeah. yeah. So. Well, you you played Windy and Warm on that album. That's kind of an unusual flat-picking selection. Yeah. Uh, I... I I heard Jed Atkins play that on a record. Okay, yeah. Is why I got that. And so, I ended up playing some sloppy bass on it because Bobby Sloan couldn't play a tune that complicated on an acoustic bass. So I overdubbed the bass myself on Windy and Warm. Yeah. Have you played much bass? No, but... If I if I, that would have been my second calling in this life, is if I hadn't have been a guitar player, I definitely would have been an acoustic bass player. Mm-hmm. I mean, Neil Sandy Horse had been a, yeah. a 
Patterson. You yeah. know, the Danish bass player. Oh, sure. He, he played my, with Oscar Peters. He's not my bass player for no reason. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how much you've heard of him. And how yeah, well, I, I, mean, I, I grew up, so you know, growing up, in, growing up in Sweden, he played in Sweden often, and he, he was yeah. just fantastic. My brother met him. Oh, geez. And I met him. He was such a nice guy. And yeah. God, what a musician. And he died too early. I know. He was so sad. Yeah, he fell yeah. over dead with a heart attack at age yeah. 54, I think. Is what yeah. It was. But let's pick up later on. You know? We do that, my brother. It's so good to hear you, uh, voice and everything. And, and uh, we'll, we'll talk soon again. And I, I, I love to hear you talk about the different recordings and uh, I'd like to hear about in next time we talk maybe talk about the recording of Manzanita or you know California Autumn or what, what's your what's your favorite if you look at your own solo project what, what's your favorite album what, what, are, what are you most proud of what which album uh-huh. Gee, I'd have to think about it. The first thing that comes to mind is me and my guitar, but mm-hmm. uh, there's three or four of them in there that I wouldn't choose a favorite from. Mm. I mean, I like to look at them as just all being different. But they're very, they have a lot of personality or individuality to, like, compare hold on the shoulder to Native American or something like that. That's very different. It's both great, but it's just different. Well, the one thing I wanted to do, not deliberately doing this, but what I wanted to do was play music I was hearing in my head without Mm. regard to any categorization of any kind. Uh whatever tunes I played and whatever instrumentation I chose to use or harmony vocals or any of that, Mm -hmm. I was going to do that the way I was hearing it in my head. And people were either going to buy it or they weren't. And Mm -hmm. uh, as a result, that musical freedom turned out some stuff that I'm very proud of. Uh, now, there is a favorite bluegrass album of mine, but every bluegrass album I've ever recorded in my life is the, well, I call it the Grammy album because it got nominated for a Grammy. Mm-hmm. It's the one with Bill Emerson uh, on called Plays and Sings Bluegrass. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, with John Darcy and all of them. Yeah, it had a whole bunch of different musicians on there. You remember what year that was recorded? No, I wouldn't have any idea. Yeah. See, that was recorded. It wasn't all recorded in one session. In fact, okay. I had very few albums in one sitting where I would mm-hmm. take a clipboard of tunes with the arrangements laid out. In uh-huh. it. I mean, all that stuff that I recorded in those days, the order of solos, <laughs> things like that were done on the fly. John. Yeah. We didn't have any arrangements after they learned just the basic chords of the tune. I'd say, I'm going to kick this off. You know, I'll nod to you guys what's coming next. Mm-hmm. Then the next thing I'd say is, Billy, roll that tape. Yeah. And he'd roll it, and whatever happened, happened. Right. You know. Talking about Bill Wolf now, I guess. Yeah, talking about yeah. Billy Wolf. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, I wanted it to be on the fly and have spontaneity to it. Yeah. You know, and uh, musical freedom, 100% right. for all of the musicians. And I'm one, you know, me, I never like to discuss music, uh, the technical aspect of music. I never like to discuss it that much anyway, or never. Uh, it's not that I didn't like you, it's just that I would uh, avoid it under some certain stance, certain mm-hmm. when, it, when it gets to be too long and drawn out. 
you know, it can get <laughs> it can get that way pretty easy. Well, yeah, uh, there's ways you know I can just, you know condense it down and things like that, but mm-hmm. you know, but let's stay in touch and let's do it. Good. Sounding good. Well, you know, let's stay in touch. I'm, I'm, my regards to Teresa and yeah. healing processes going on here. There's a lot of physical and mental healing yeah. has to be done, but there's it's all doable. But you got it, man. Okay. All right. Well, we'll talk again soon, my friend. Okay, and I love you with all my heart. Love you too, Tony. You take care and uh, stay warm. We'll talk soon. We'll talk. Okay. Good night, brother.